Thank you so much for your time, Professor Alzheimer. And My pleasure. I want to start right away with the first question. Yes. Uh, your research focuses especially on the populist radical right in Europe. Yes. Uh, how have you observed the evolution of far-right parties across different European countries in recent years? Mm -hmm. How do you see the impact of economic factors on the rise of these moments? And mm -hmm. to what extent do cultural and identity issues play a role? Yeah, um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, first and foremost, I think the trajectory of the radical right in Europe is upwards. So what we see across a range of countries is that the vote share of these parties has increased and that they have moved from the margins of the political system towards the mainstream, first in terms of their electoral importance, uh, but also in the impact they have on other parties and on what you could call the public discourse. And um, this discourse, insofar as it is shaped by the radical right, um, is focused on the notion of crisis. So, um, the change you see across different European countries in terms of um, the composition of society, but also the composition of the economy, for instance, is seen as a crisis and the radical right um, starts itself as the defender of the ordinary people against these changes. And um, to come to the second part of your question, um, the two aspects of this change that is perceived as a crisis closely interlinked. So it's not just uh, about the worry that immigrants could take away our jobs or that our jobs are going to China or to Central and Eastern Europe or wherever. Um, it is also about the impression that immigration and other processes like the transformation of the economy, like the decline of mining, um, like the decline of the internal combustion engine and so forth and so forth are changing the way we live in a way that is framed as a threat to the native population. So it's always both, um, and empirically, it's quite, quite difficult if you look at public opinion data um, to separate the effects of economic anxieties and cultural threat perceptions. It's I wouldn't say one one and the same, but it's very closely interlinked in the minds of voters. Right. Germany was considered an exception to the success of populist radical right and far right parties until the rise of alternative for Deutschland. What factors contributed to Germany's resistance to right wing populism mm -hmm. for an extended period? And how did the AFD manage to break this trend? Yeah. In other words, how do you explain the success of Cordon Sanitaire until very recently? And what factors could contribute to its demise? Uh -huh. um, first, you are right. Um, the AFD, which was only founded 10 years ago, is the first national successfully a radical right party since at least the 1960s in Germany. Um, and I think what has helped to create and maintain a condo sanitaire against the radical right um, is first that right-wing far-right actors in Germany have been quite extreme in their approach. So um, the most successful of the radical right parties that we see in Western Europe, the Scandinavian parties, but also um, the PVV in the Netherlands, even the National Front, now the National Rally in France, um, have over time moderated their stance to be more electable by people who are not uh, quite at the margins of society. Um, whereas in Germany, there has been a tendency amongst far-right actors to stay true um, to the roots of German right-wing extremism in the 1930s and 1940s, which was um, of course, appalling to most Germans. And so that was one factor which has limited um, their success. Um, another factor has been that the far right in Germany was divided for a long time. So you had different relatively small parties competing which, with each others and um, keeping each others below the 5% threshold. That has certainly helped. Um, also, 
um, the main mainstream right party, the Christian Democrats, have traditionally covered a very broad um, spectrum in, in terms of the, their ideology, um, spanning almost from the center left to um, a rather robust brand of conservatism. And for decades, they could appeal um, to a very broad coalition of voters um, some of them later moved to um, the far-right AFD once this option became available. Um, one final point, um, how, how did the AFD manage to break through this cordon sanitaire or to establish themselves um, in spite of the cordon is because they didn't start out as a radical right party. Um, when they first emerged in 2013, they were a, a rather soft Eurosceptic party. Um, their most prominent member and co-founder was a former member of the CDU who claimed um, that the CDU um, that he had joined as a young man had, had left him because they had moved towards the left so much under Merkel stewardship. Um, so they were at least acceptable um, to voters who had previously supported um, the mainstream right parties, the FDP, CDU, CSU. Uh, and only over the course of the first um, three years, perhaps, of their existence, it became clear um, that they developed into a fully-fledged radical right party. And then they were already present in, in parliament. They were already a political factor. Um, they had a lot of media coverage. And so they managed to establish themselves um, in spite of this cordon sanitaire, which had been in place for such a long time. Okay, uh, your research discussed the transformation of AFD, AFD from its moderately Eurosceptic beginnings to a more radical right-wing stance. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on the key factors and events that led to this ideological shift within the AFD? Yeah, um, first it's important to recognize that from the very beginning, um, various right-wingers of different stripes and brands were present in the party. It's just um, that those people I mentioned in my previous answer, the former members of the CDU or FDP, were more prominent. These were the, the front row uh, politicians for this new party. But already in 2014, um, a sort of power struggle emerged between those more moderate uh, proponents of the AFD and more radical forces within the party. And uh, by 2015, this had escalated to a point um, that Bernd Lucke, one of the co-founders of the party and arguably their most prominent face, left the party and took with him around about 10% of the membership. And these 10% were disproportionately from, you could say, the middle management level of the party. Um, so that, that was one important factor, that there was um, almost like a split between this more moderate, moderate faction and more radical forces within society, uh, within the party. Um, also, the, um, the environment changed considerably with the advent of many refugees from Syria and the Middle East more generally in 2015, 2016. So that pushed the issue of immigration on the agenda and the AFD could capitalize um, on, on this changed um, agenda. Um, focusing on immigration and multiculturalism became something like a recipe for success. And um, this also strengthened the more radical voices within the party. Um, and finally, the party had become so established that even more radical um, forces within the party, which had quite open links with traditional right-wing extremism outside and inside the party, um, came to the fore, most prominently um, Björn Höcke, who is the regional leader in one of the eastern states. He, he really is um, the face of the ultra um, radicals within the party. And there have been successive attempts to remove him from the party, to expel him. Uh, but none of these attempts were successful. And now he's something like um, the great eminence within the party. And it would be very difficult to imagine that anything important happens within the party without his assent. Apparently, the AFD has emerged as a formidable force in German politics. Yeah. How has the party altered the political landscape 
-hmm. And what repercussions does it, its presence carry for German politics? What impact is AFD likely to have on the political trajectory of CDU and CSU? Mm -hmm. Considering the broader context, what implications does the AFD's prominence hold for the European Union? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, first, the AFD is a considerable force in uh, various state parliaments in Germany, especially um, in the eastern states where the AFD at the moment is probably the strongest party in the party system at around about 30, 35 percent of the vote. And so one immediate impact um, of the AFD success in subnational politics has been um, that the CDU was forced to enter rather strange coalitions with the Greens, with the SPD, with the FDP, um, very heterogeneous oversized coalitions at the state level to avoid working with the AFD. So that is, is one important impact. And this is not going away. Um, there are three upcoming state elections and there is even a chance, and I think we'll get to this, um, that the AFD might come close to seize a state premiership and become um, the leading force in one of the eastern states. Um, secondly, the AFD has put considerable pressure on the CDU um, because many politicians within the CDU feel um, that they have lost part of their support, but also part of their identity as a conservative party to the AFD. Um, so there is um, a discourse within uh, the CDU that claims that Merkel's uh, stewardship of the party and of the country was a disaster because she moved the party too much towards the center or even towards the left. Um, of course, she had majorities, she controlled chancellorship for 16 years, uh, but um, still, um, this is seen as a problem by some within the party, and they want to um, get the CDU tough on immigration, tough on cultural issues, um, move the party back towards the positions now claimed by the AFD, whereas others within the party say um, that German society has changed considerably, that uh, Merkel was successful because she recognized those changes, and repositioned the CDU in a way which helped her to cling to power um, for one and a half decades, which is, uh, of course, quite a feat. Um, so that's a, a second impact of the AFD's success. And I think the, the third impact is even bigger uh, because even within um, the SPD and the FDP, there is now talk um, that as a reaction to the AFD's successes, um, th those parties would have to reposition themselves. They would have to get tough on immigration. Um, they would have to appeal more to their traditional constituencies, in the case of the SPD, um, of industrial workers, um, more generally working class people, and should put le uh, less emphasis um, on issues such as gender equality or climate protection or whatever. So that's the, the third impact that the whole discourse has shifted somewhat to the right. Um, what that means for Europe is, I think, um, a different question because personally, I don't see um, the AFD going into any sort of coalition at the national level. Uh, and there is a very broad agreement still within German political space that European um, integration, perhaps even unification, is a good thing. Um, of course, there is this um, push for what you could call fiscal prudence um, in, in Germany uh, with its relationships with Europe, uh, but that doesn't undermine the fact that um, both German parties, broadly speaking, and German population, broadly speaking, are very pro-European. Um, and even the AFD, um, of course, they attack the European Union, as a matter of fact, uh, but it's not a huge contributing factor in their success at the moment. Um, so, uh, strange as it may seem, I, I think the impact um, on the issue of European integration is, is quite minimal at the moment. Um, what might be a consequence is that success, um, that, that German governments 
um, might support a more restrictive European policy on immigration, because um, this is something where the German government so far um, within the European Union is holding a relatively liberal line. Um, it is a minority of European governments which still support this relatively liberal line, and there is domestic pressure on the German government um, to move its position. And to, to a degree, this has already happened. All right. Uh, could you explain how the AFD's current support aligns with the typical image of European radical right voters? What fundamental motivations drive support for the AFD among its voters? Yeah. How significant is the role of anti-immigration sentiment in the AFD's ascension? Yeah, um, it is absolutely essential for the support of the AFD, as it is absolutely essential for the support um, of other European radical right parties, immigration, especially immigration from non-European countries, um, is what is, is driving, or concerns about immigration, uh, is what is driving the support um, for these parties. So um, not, not everyone who's skeptical about immigration is a radical right voter. Not everyone supports these very radical policies. But if you look at the electorate, um, of the AFD in Germany, but also of the PVV uh, or other comparable parties in other European countries, uh, you would be hard pressed to find a single voter who thinks immigration is a great thing and I'm supporting this party um, for other motives. And then there's um, a lot of secondary motives, issues such as um, denying climate change, um, worrying about gender equality, worrying about same-sex marriages and whatnot, everything that is seen um, as cultural change is also closely um, aligned to support for the radical right. So it's Euroscepticism, but this is really secondary motives. Um, if you strip those away, what remains is um, resistance to immigration, resistance to European societies becoming more diverse and multicultural. That is, is really the most important factor for the AFD and for any of these other parties. One of your studies explores the impact of place on populist uh -huh. radical right sentiment in Germany. Yes. Regarding the impact of place on populist radical right attitudes, how do you how do regional disparities, such as those in the former GDR, mm -hmm. still influence political sentiments and what policy implications does this have? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, what we see across Europe is that support for these parties is often um, concentrated in certain parts of the country. And more often than not, these are rural areas or areas with rather run down smaller towns. Um, so what we did in this study was that we tried to measure the impact of objective indicators for deprivation, such as um, demographic change or declining public infrastructure or high unemployment or very high rates of immigration, stuff like that. And even if we control that, even if we control food composition of the local population, so for instance, we know that younger, better educated people are less likely to support a radical right, whereas um, particularly older men with lower levels of formal education support a radical right in disproportionate numbers. But even if we control for the composition of the local population, even if we control for immigration and for deprivation, we still find a rather strong effect of a place being in the former GDR. Um, 30 years after unification, there is still something lingering about this part of Germany, um, which leads to an increase in support for the radical right. And there are very many possible explanations for this. Um, one is um, that, of course, it was an authoritarian regime, so perhaps that left um, an authoritarian mindset. Um, another explanation is that immigration in the GDR was actually very low. Um, to the present day, there are relatively few immigrants living um, in rural parts of the former GDR um, in particular, so people are perhaps simply not used to being exposed to immigration, to people who look different and might have a different culture. 
Um, there is also this argument that um, people living in the former GDR are ridiculed, um, treated as second-class citizens. And this is a sort of backlash um, against this perceived Western superiority. Um, all, all these possible explanations are pulling in the same direction, but it's, it's very difficult to separate them from each other. Um, but the one thing that really stands out is what we have called place resentment, the feeling um, that the area, the town, the region where you live doesn't get um, enough recognition, it doesn't get enough resources, but particularly um, not enough recognition. And that really seems to be a contributing factor um, in this, this very strange GDI effect that we see to the present day. Uh, given the growing strength of AFD, there are calls from SPD mm -hmm. to ban the party. Yeah. How do you evaluate the arguments and considerations behind these calls for banning AFD? Yeah, um, that's another very good and quite tricky question. Um, so the hurdles for banning a party in Germany are exceptionally high. Um, there are only three institutions, the Federal Council, Federal Government, Federal Parliament, that could initiate a ban, uh, but they don't have the power. They just can ask the highest court in the country, the Federal Constitutional Court, to consider the ban. And the Federal Constitutional Court would need to be convinced um, that this party in question is a threat to the existence of democracy in Germany. Uh, and even if um, this argument could be made, you would need a supermajority in the court. So two thirds of the sitting judges would have to support this view. Uh, and only then could you ban a party. And the last time um, that actually happened was in 1956, uh, when the Communist Party was banned. And even then, um, that was controversial. There have been two more attempts in the past um, to ban the NPD. The NPD is another far-right party in Germany. It's quite small by now. Um, it's a real neo-Nazi party. They make, um, they make no secret of their allegations with the Nazi rule. And even um, those, this party could not be banned uh, because the federal constitutional court said, well, they, they might be neo-Nazis, but this is a tiny political sect. Um, this is not really a threat to the constitutional order of Germany, and so we're not going to ban them. Um, so the risk um, of being unsuccessful in this process is very high, and many politicians are worried that, um, first, this will be seen as limiting political competition. Obviously, it would feed into the narrative of the AFD of being victimized, ostracized the German politics. They could tell their supporters that they're really suppressed. And um, now the establishment is even using legal means um, to limit competition, to take away your vote. Uh, the headlines are writing themselves. Um, and even if they took that risk, it might be, um, it, it would be a lengthy process. And at the end of it, the federal constitutional court might say, no, we're, we're not going to ban this party. And this would be like a seal of approval. Um, so many German politicians, the German government is, is very reluctant to go down that road. The argument in favor perhaps is uh, that there are people within the AFD who are really a threat to the constitutional order. They quite openly talk uh, about remigrating people. That means that people who have a German passport, people who have been living legally in this country, or even their parents have already been legally in this country, uh, should be expelled from Germany because their, their skin color is the wrong tone or their surname is um, of, of the wrong kind. Um, this was this created quite a stir last week in German politics, but this is really not a new development. These voices have been around for a long time. I mentioned Björn Höcker. Uh, he even wrote a book um, back in, I think, 2020, 2019, where he campaigned um, for such horrible ideas. Um, so if Björn Höcke is, is close to becoming minister president, state premier of the German state, 
um, if the AfD is the strongest party in many parts of the German East, then perhaps there is a threat to liberal democracy. And this is why other politicians, journalists, professors, and so on and so forth, uh, claim that we should at least consider the, pos the possibility of banning the AfD before it's too late, and we can't get rid of them in any other way. So these are broadly the arguments in favor and against such a ban. It's a huge political risk. It would take a long time, uh, but it might be a necessary mean because some of them are really trying to undermine um, democracy in Germany as we know it. The last sentence of your article titled, Don't Mention the War, yeah. how populist right-wing radicalism became almost normal in Germany, reads, I quote, therefore my prediction is that as in other countries, the rise of a far right-wing populist party will make Germany less flexible mm -hmm. and more inward looking than it already is. This doesn't bode well for German and for European politics. Mm -hmm. But five years later, do you believe your prediction has been vindicated or has Germany in fact become more flexible and outward looking? Um, in a sense, I think it has been vindicated insofar as we spend an awful lot of energy in Germany on discussing the rise of the AfD, on um, considering if and how we should accommodate the voters, if we need more restrictions, if we need to put more emphasis on the national interest and stuff like that. Uh, and that, that occupies um, the German elites and this um, occupies political energy that I think could be spent um, elsewhere. So in a sense, yeah, Germany is even, even more inward looking than it was five years ago. Having said that, obviously the environment has changed radically with the war against Ukraine, um, also with Brexit and the outfall of that with the need to um, think about European security in the shadow of a poss possible second Trump presidency, uh, which would make things much more difficult for Europeans on, on many ways. So I think um, Germany has become a bit more flexible in its relationship um, with the use of military power, in its willingness to deliver military support to Ukraine, um, to work with its European neighbors to support Ukraine, um, and of course to accept many, many European, uh, Ukrainian refugees into Germany. Uh, but this is something that Germany was was forced to do by these external changes. So I, I still feel sort of vindicated, even if I wasn't perfectly right. How do you assess the recently exposed? Uh, you're frozen now. Where discussions about deporting millions of people with a German ethnic background, including citizens, took place. Sorry, I couldn't hear the last question. Could you repeat it, please? Yes, sure. How do you assess the recently exposed meeting ah, involving right. AFT politicians yeah. and neo Nazis? Yeah, well, I already touched upon that. So um, it created or it, it triggered a public outcry, and rightfully so, because these are horrible ideas, which really remind you of the 1930s and the 1940s and the Nazis' plan to exterminate Jews and um, all that. So this is, is huge. Um, having said that, it fits with the development of the AFD over the last, let's say, five to six years. Um, so that that guy, Martin Zellner, who attended this meeting, is a well-known right-wing extremist from Austria. He's the former leader of the Identitarian Movement. Um, officially, the AFD says um, that um, there is incompatibility between membership in the Identitarian Movement, membership in the AFD, but in reality, and uh, many members, particularly of the youth wing of the AFD, are also in the Identitarian Movement, and many members of the Identitarian Movement um, have even been hired as, staffers, uh, as, as staffers, staffers for um, AFD members of parliament. 
Um, also, during their last party conference um, for the European election, for the upcoming European election, when they drew up the list, um, many of those running um, on those lists voiced very similar ideas at the party conference. And the party leadership was present and no one batted an eyelid. Um, so it's it's not a huge surprise. It's not news as such, uh, but there is now more public recognition of these tendencies within the AFD. And lastly, what, what is your prediction regarding AFD's potential performance in upcoming European Parliament elections? Yeah. Do you believe the AFD could replicate the success of Gilders, Gilders party in the Netherlands? Yeah, I think that's quite um, quite possible. Um, the AFD is at around about 20-21% at the moment in the national polls, uh, but we know that turnout in European elections is often lower. Many people do not take European elections terribly seriously. Um, there is a, a lower threshold, which is relevant for the AFD, uh, at the moment, but one consequence of that is that, is that people are more willing to experiment with their vote and to vote for outside parties. So um, I expect that they will have a, a very strong showing um, in the European elections, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the vote, I think. Professor Arzumayr, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. I appreciate that. And many thanks for the very interesting questions. All right. All the best. And you too. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.